<coughs> excuse me, I hope you guys have stuff to talk about. And uh, it doesn't need to be questions, obviously. I'm interested in any points of view that we can share and uh, develop together. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to come. Uh, my name's Dave. I'm a director in our research and strategy group. Um, my background is in psychology and communications theory, and I'm part of this uh, research team, mostly, that looks at the questions of why we have buildings. So I thought I'd just start uh, not knowing many of you, although we've met, and I, we're going to defer on the 400 slide history of the binder bin until the second half. <laughs> so you'll just have to wait for a minute. But I thought we'd at least start with just a, a simple question of why is it that um, you think clients have buildings? Why do they bother? What is it that's driving organizations to have buildings today? They need shelter. Yep, that's a, that's a biggie. Today's kind of a cold, nasty day, and you've got to get them out of the rain, and computers work better when they stay dry. So that's a big deal. Culture. What about culture? Um, it's, it's hard to have the culture of the organization if you're sitting home at the kitchen table. There's the, I think you can have that. You, I think you can go home once you have some you know, understanding of who you work with and what mm. the organization is, but I think it's hard to relate and feel connected to the organization that you work for mm -hmm. if you don't have some place to go and come together at least mm -hmm. occasionally. Mm -hmm. Anybody tracking the uh, the dynamics of the uh, the dual announcements this week from Best Buy and Yahoo? Yeah. About saying, yeah, it's time. So uh, the woman who is uh, the head of Yahoo, who's an ex-Google person, of course, um, mandated that everybody come into the office now, that they had had a policy where people could work essentially wherever they wanted to. And um, we'd have to say that Yahoo's in an interesting moment of transition, as is Best Buy, of course. Both of them are uh, at tricky times in terms of deciding how they're going to deliver the next generation of value to their respective audiences. And uh, both decided, uh, Best Buy uh, moving backward in many ways on a program called ROW, Results Only Work Environment, which they um, have really been one of the prime progenitors of over the number, last number of years. So both, as an interesting kind of reflection on the model of why we have buildings, in tricky times decided to bring people back together again. And so that is one of the reasons, of course, is the social purpose um, for building. So what I thought we'd do is just walk through uh, a few images and talk a little bit and sort of see where this wants to go. So I thought in reference to being in Chicago, um, Jay Doblin, of course, started a firm here, one of the great design firms back in the era of streamlining uh, called Doblin and Associates and later JDA and now uh, merged in with a couple of other major design firms. But Jay Doblin is one of the fathers, really, of this whole question of how good design happens and what design really means. And I think in terms of thinking about buildings, it certainly can mean all sorts of different things. And if we come at buildings from a real estate point of view or a utilization point of view or an occupancy point of view, you could say, well, buildings are really about efficiency. So let's get the efficiency up. Let's get the cost down to the client. Let's negotiate the leases properly, et cetera. If you talk to a typical uh, sort of HR type person, they might tell you that buildings are actually about departments and entitlement and status and rank. And we organize our standards program around that sort of thing. And if you were to talk to a knowledge worker, they might say something totally different. They might say that space is actually about how I behave and how I perform and who I'm with and how I do the things that generate value. And so depending upon the audience, you'd get a range of different things. But I think one thing is certainly true, and that's this idea that buildings always reflect culture. Buildings are very much a part of the nature of how cities work, how cities evolve. People come here to this city, know nothing about architecture, get on the boat and go on the architecture tour. Why? Why do people do that? Why are people so inherently drawn to something that's really as utilitarian and abstract as a place for shelter? Why are they drawn to that? What is it that causes it? So we'll talk a little bit about that. I think part of this reflects back to our human side and we care pretty deeply about the places we choose to live as families, as individuals. And we modify these over the course of our lives fairly organically. Um, it's not really a big discussion about are you going to continue to live in your parents' home forever. You know, at some point you're going to leave and you'll move someplace else. You go to college and you'll have a roommate and then you'll move into an apartment and then you'll graduate and go to school again maybe or get a job and you'll get married and you'll have kids and then you'll retire and then you'll die and they'll put you in a little room, they call it a box <laughs> at the end. But all of this stuff sort of happens fairly organically and we don't spend a gigantic amount of time worrying about how much it costs, it's kind of just the boundary, right? So we've all got one of these and this one is pretty pathetic but <laughs> it, it is what it is and uh, 
I think we get way too obsessed. In fact, I mentioned earlier if uh, oh, an organization called Acre, I gave a talk here a couple of years ago. Uh, Acre is, anybody a member of Acre? A-E-C-R-E. -E. It's attorneys who are corporate real estate executives. It's a really boring group, to be honest with you. <laughs> Colin Dyer, who was at JLL at the time, and I were the leads, were the speakers at the lunch entertainment section of the thing. And I found it kind of interesting because we both talked about the same thing. JLL was at the time profoundly interested in workspace and trying to figure out what they should be doing about that. My talk was entitled, What Are You Going to Do If you, The Dog Catches the Car? And basically the premise of all this was that um, you know, dogs chase cars all the time, right? And they don't really ever plan on catching the car. So what happens if you're in corporate real estate and you chase the last nickel out of the deal? The last deal and the last nickel finally evaporates. And then where are we? So what's the purpose? What's the purpose of buildings? Is it just to make them be cheaper? Today we would think in many ways it is. Now certainly Chicago is a really interesting market. It's quite different than say Dallas. Dallas is in a very different situation. People don't want to be in downtown Dallas. They want to escape downtown Dallas. And as a result, you have an opposite dynamic to what goes on in, the, in Chicago. And so we care about this stuff, and we think about it related to money. And it all fits together in some interesting ways. And I would say the other point I'd make about this one is that we think about our homes in a completely different way than we think about our office spaces. And of course you would. I mean, one is where you live, and you raise your family there, and you it's your it's your sovereign place where you can escape and all of this stuff. But in some ways, much of the deep stuff inside of us, inside of our old brain, actually works the same way regardless of where we are. The other thing that's interesting about it is we haven't really done a lot yet to change the sort of overarching ways that we really operationalize space use and the value of space to organizations. We tend to think of offices in a fairly shallow way. In fact, that was one of the things that to me was so interesting this week about the Yahoo announcement and Best Buy's announcement immediately after, which highlighted the fact that both Google and Apple, arguably two of the most successful companies over the last decade, have had a philosophy and a policy of creating places that are so compelling that people want to be there. Rather than thinking about space as basically bad because it's a cost and therefore the best it can be is less bad, so make it cost less, that necessary evil model of buildings, which is in some ways where much of the market is today, they think about it quite opposite of that. And so they think very intentionally about the purpose of buildings. And we maybe don't end up with buildings that look quite like some of these archetypical bad examples. Our point of view on this is uh, a straightforward one. Churchill said this at the following the, the ending of the war, World War II. Of course, Parliament had been burned badly um, by a V2 strike, and they were trying to figure out what to do. So Parliament's an ancient structure. It had been around for many, many years. <coughs> And it was outmoded in many ways. And so the natural tendency was to think, how do we improve Parliament? And of course, it's a fairly historic building. So most of the improvement was considered towards the interior. What are we going to do to improve the interior? And so as we know, if you're a parliamentarian in, in England, you suit up prior to going into chamber. You put on a robe and oftentimes a wig. And the room in which this happened, the cloaking room, was very small. And the number of members had expanded over the years. And it was too small, arguably, and by almost any measure. So members were trying diff to get their robes on, and they were bumping into people, and they were excusing themselves. And I'm, excuse me, sir, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, Churchill said, don't change that. Don't change that. That's what gets them ready for the things that we have to do when we come together. It's the physical proximity, it's the bumping into, it's the collisions, it's the interruptions, it's the excusing. It's those human activities that ultimately prepare these people to make policy. It's the human relationships upon which the negotiations are based. And I think he's right on that. I mean, there's little debate, I think, about this. So for us, it's an interesting time. Um, let me just give you a quick drawing of something here. Uh, you know that you've been doing whiteboards a long time when you always, 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 always check. To not only to find out if you can use it on a whiteboard, but if it's actually a whiteboard, because I've written on a couple of projection screens over the years, and that's almost never well received. So let me just draw this real quickly. Um, this is an example, uh, not obviously mathematically correct, 
of a line that I believe is happening in our business today. And when I say our business, I don't mean Steelcase. I mean anybody in this room who deals with space as a business, design firms, real estate people, corporate real estate types, whoever. What does that represent? Anybody have a thought? Say it again. Square feet per person. Absolutely, it's that. Um, it's more than that, too, but it is that. And that essentially is driven by this. So square foot per person reduction is driven by technology. How is that possible? Well, obviously this enables, this technologic evolution, enables job design, or said differently, simply work, to happen in a different way, in a distributed way, right? Not always, not universally, not by fiat, but in many ways by choice, because as we move from a routine process to a cognitive and social process based to the economy, what we find, of course, is that this job design driving into this preference for people is actually changing the culture of organizations. And so we come back around to both of the comments that were made earlier, that the reason for buildings is ultimately about these things. This, to your correct point, is the amount of office space that's required in the developed economies of the world, not just in North America, but the developed economies more generally, the amount of space that's required by office workers doing office work at the office. In other words, if I don't need to be at the office, I don't need the space. And that office space, therefore, per user is going down, right? And it's going down ultimately because we can work in different ways in different locations. There's another interesting trend that's going on at the same time, by the way, because this reflects the developed economies, and that's this one which is the amount of office work that's happening globally overall. And that's going up like a rocket. But it's very spotty, it's very patchy. So you could say, my gosh, India, the giant population, 1.2 billion people, you know, we can all name 15 cities in India that we didn't even know existed a few years ago that are over a million people easily, and China has 100 over a million. And so there's these unbelievable sort of growth patches, and yet India is still 94% an agrarian economy. So it's very spotty. It's very spotty. However, on balance, the growth that we're seeing here is not only a market opportunity, because it is that, but it's really a reflection of what IBM would call the globally integrated enterprise. And so labor arbitrage, which started, as we know, a couple of decades ago that allowed us to move work that could be electronic or computerized to any place on the planet to capitalize on well-educated workforces and lower labor costs allowed the global economy to begin to expand. When information could flow, whether it's finance or work, changed everything. And so I would say that this chart, or some version of that idea, is the mystery that we as a company are facing. And I would argue that all of us who are in the space business are facing as well. So how do you tackle this idea that work can happen almost anywhere. And that that green line really suggests not just face-to-face -face work, but the integrative part that goes along with technology. And the cultural part that goes along with cross-cultural work. And time zone variant work. That begins to blend us into all sorts of different kinds of relationships and equations that we really haven't dealt with before. So we've had global trade, arguably, since the Vikings or Marco Polo or something like this. But actually what we've had is international business. Being globally integrated enterprises is a totally different thing and we're just starting to get over the cusp of that. Now there are some companies that have been more globally integrated for longer and it's worth studying them. So the oil companies are good examples of this. They've been pretty globally integrated for 75 years. But even they, and I've worked with one of them in particular a lot recently, would say that they're becoming a different kind of an organization as they work together more in teams across these boundaries. So this creates some mysteries for us. Mysteries are about research. Choices is about the things that a business chooses to execute next. So that's a strategy question. I would say that the research and strategy components of the decision tree that causes a prototype like this building we're sitting in today, this space we're sitting in today, WorkSpring, is really a prototype. It's a way of experimenting with the idea of what would happen if we had all sorts of different working away from the office needs that got expressed. How would that go? Is this a co-working place? Well, kinda. It's a little different than that. But what's a co-working place like? And what might a neighborhood cottage be like where work could happen in a walking community? And these are all different iterations on this idea. So when we say today, you can kind of work anywhere. I, my boss doesn't know where I am today. I mean, she doesn't even live in the same city. So she doesn't know what I'm doing. 
She's not managing me in any way that my dad or my mom would understand. So this idea that, that we can do what we need to do is actually a phenomenal point of personal empowerment to people, if we think of it that way. The era that we're in is no longer the you've been sent home because the real estate cost was high and we believed we could downsize our space requirement and still trust that you were going to do something at home because by the way we can keep track of you electronically now. It's not that so much anymore. It's really about working where you need to be and making that choice happen and that and remember you're talking to the research guy, the futures guy, the guy that's supposed to be looking out. What I would say we see is an abundantly clear pattern separate the examples of Best Buy and Yahoo is that people are being given the freedom to choose. And that is the killer app. People having the freedom to choose. Are we all there universally at the same time? Heavens no. This is in the process of emerging. It's the chrysalis unfolding. And it's going to change everything, we believe. So let's talk about this for a second. How long has civilization existed? Human civilization. What's the, anybody got a guess? Roughly 10,000 years. Species for 400, civilization for 10, give or take. So let's talk through 10,000 years of architectural history in 10 minutes and just sort of see where this takes us. Well, actually, it starts exactly where you were, Jack, a minute ago. It starts here with shelter. This has always been the case. It's always been the need. It was true prior to 10,000, of course. I mean, we had to have shelter. It's Maslowian. It's the bottom of the pyramid. You have to be there. Second thing that happened was symbols. So very early on, humans began to use place in a symbolic way, typically worshiping of deities, uh, making certain of the connection with the divine. A uh, very standard thing in almost every society. Start small, gets big. As we get more and more people, this idea of groups of people being in conflict with each other and needing to find ways to connect and be safe is really what this is all about. The physical security of the past, by the way, is now conducted in financial terms much more in the developed economies, but same principle. And then all of these exist in the context of social relationships, community. And I would make the argument that in our 10,000 years, this gets us through the first 9,850. More or less, up until the dawn of the industrial era, what drove our activities and our use of place was largely related to this. Now, something changed in the dawning of the industrial age, and that fundamentally had to do with a couple of things. The first was the inversion of the labor capital relationship. We're familiar with this idea. Up until this point, economies had been driven by labor. Capital was a relatively small thing. As this began to shift, we began to be able to invest in mechanization, which made capital the big tool, opened up the world not only in a manufacturing and industrial sense, but also in a financial sense. And we saw the game begin to change in fairly substantial ways. This plays out today. We're still living in the middle of this. The other thing that happened, however, is we began to build business organizations that were bigger. Up until this point, most business organizations weren't large. They were small. It was family farms. So mom and I have the farm. We got a couple of kids. We raise the crops. I fix the harness at night. She darns the socks. We have a small store. That's the way it went. There just weren't a lot of large businesses. And so when these gigantic organizations began to happen as a result of that inversion, we started to see the adoption of the sort of church model or the military model in organizations. Even governments, by the way, weren't very large in most cases back at that point. What was large was the Catholic Church, and it was structured very much like this. So you got a kind of one pope, we got a new conclave going on, that's pretty cool. Any March Madness betters out there on who's gonna <laughs> show up quickly out of the herd? So we sort of had that happening, and then the military thing, one general, lots of privates. These were the models we understood. It was very command control, you know, quite literal. And so we kind of adopted this model. And that became part and parcel as we invented this idea of an industrial age organization. The other thing that was happening, actually two things, were that the toolbox started to change. So we began to understand how to build buildings in different ways. Buildings that could go up without getting thick. So up until this point, we didn't really know how to build buildings in a, ma in a manageable way that could create a cityscape. Cityscapes tended to be low, frame construction, etc. The Great Chicago Fire, we all know this sort of story. So we began to understand how to do building technologies that allowed the construction of larger buildings. But at the same time, we were inventing a variety of things that went inside of those buildings that made tall usable. So elevators and lighting and 
uh, plumbing and HVAC, all of these things incrementally coming along over the decades to inform that. The other piece that was simultaneously developing was the technologic piece, the communicative piece, the information management piece, beginning with the transatlantic telegraph really, or the telegraph on land initially, the ability to send over great distances relatively simple messages instantaneously. Change it everything. Changed everything. The telephone, of course, followed that. The typewriters often neglected in this evolution. That was a pretty important tool as well. It resulted in the non-printing press development of multiple copies, which made it easier for people to move things through a system. So we see the evolution of all this stuff. And I would argue that this got us through the next hundred years, up until roughly the middle of this last century, the 19 or the 20th century, up until give or take 1950. And what happened really in 1959 in specific were two important things. First, Peter Drucker, the great management sage, coined the phrase knowledge work. This startled me the first time I stumbled across this. We, we think of knowledge work as a relatively recent idea. And of course, Drucker has always been ahead on everything. But he coined this nearly 60 years ago. That's a long time. And we've been developing back from or out from this since that period. The other thing that happened was Noyce received the patent for the integrated circuit, which changed everything as well. Now the integrated circuit, of course, is what makes computerization possible. It sprang out of the evolution of the transistor during the war. But this whole idea that we could begin the process of growing an information management infrastructure really is tied at the technological level here and at the utilization level here to those two big ideas. This was the beginning of what we knew as the next era, more or less. And there are all sorts of ways of defining industrial era and information era. I won't go into all of that stuff. But I would say that what changed is we began to see this idea of the organization man, and it was largely men at this point, women's role in the workforce separate from World War II was still largely um, low-level clerical activities or not in the workforce at all. And we had the movement away from the sort of routine process, offices the back in support of the operations part of the company, which was the real business. So office work was a relatively unimportant thing that existed primarily to support order management and that sort of thing, accounting, bookkeeping, etc. We started to see that change in the middle part of the 20th century with this notion of the, uh, the ascendance of the white collar workforce. This happened largely after World War II. Of course, uh, we began also to have the long span open bay building, courtesy of Mies, another Chicago story. And we start to see the change happening in the toolbox as well. So almost all of this stuff started to become at least electric multifunctional and increasingly pervasive. So you don't have to go back very far to movies of this era. This would be the end of the black and white era to think of the pedestal with one telephone on it that's shared by all of the engineers sitting at their identical tub desks in the sea of desks model. That was sort of what that was. This was not the first time that the technologies had changed everything. And it was not the first time that the adapt adaptation to these technologies was profoundly difficult for us. So when the technology of the uh, telegraph first hit, it wasn't viewed as reliable. If you look back on the history of this stuff, it's, we play the same pattern out every single time. So we had this happen initially, we had this happen later, the transatlantic cable, now you didn't have to communicate via steamship crossing the ocean with a letter. That was what was the option up until that point, of course. Around the turn of that century, Marconi invented the idea of wireless. Again, very primitive, but we could begin to communicate without wires at all. Each one of these 50-year hits, and they happen in about that interval for some reason, changed everything about the way business was conducted. So initially, when you had a telephone, you wouldn't possibly attempt to conduct real business on it. You know, I, I said, I'm going to call someone and talk about a deal on the phone? Give me a break. Of course I'm going to go be with him in his office, and that's the way it's done. And so we've done this a hundred times. So some of you in the room are old enough to remember when email hit the first time, right? And we had went through the exact same thing. No one knew what to do with it. We were typing in large letters and we were shouting at each other and we didn't know and you know, we were forgetting that it was gonna get forwarded and re-forwarded and sent around and lost and oh my God. It took a couple of years, it took 10 years, it took 15 years for us to get our heads around it. Where are we social, with social networks today? We're in exactly the same spot again. Old farts, ah, social networking. <laughs> I don't even get it. Twitter, why would I care about Twitter? I get that it helped the Arab Spring. That the whole political thing and knowing about earthquakes in China, yeah, that's kind of valuable. But for business, 
So Boston College this year, any of you know this story? Stop giving out email accounts to students. They do it all on social networking now. We're witnessing the end of email as we know it. And most of the IT people, if you have IT friends or children, will tell you the same thing. They can't wait to get rid of email. It's an expensive app we no longer need because we can do it differently now, right? And we get attached. We get attached. We all know the people in our, in our work life for whom the Franklin Planner is still the go-to resource, <laughs> right? Or the Rolodex on their desk. So we all become attached and what happens in this is we become familiar with and learn how to learn from the tools that we grew up learning with. So look back to how you were educated. You know, as the Jesuits say, give me a boy for 10 years, right? So once you are taught a way of thinking, a way of learning, a way of creating, that tends to be part and parcel to your life forever. Now, it's not as though we can't adapt. Most of us carry cell phones now. We've kind of figured out how to use it. And many of us are, you know, fairly active on LinkedIn and starting to discover new benefits to these sorts of businessy social network sites. So this stuff is all changing. And my point in all of this is simply to say that the integration of space and technology has been an ongoing challenge for the nature of work since the beginning. There's absolutely no reason to think that won't continue. We're in the midst of it again now. The little spiky stories this week, which got an amazing amount of attention. I was surprised how much attention those stories got. It's just an example of that. So, we talked about knowledge workers. We talked about the road warrior. This was when portability hit. Remember the road warrior era? And we'd read articles about these people who were just out on the road all the time, going from account to account and client to client. And boy, they were the new heroes. We lionized these people. The gold collar worker, remember that era? The road warrior is gold collar worker, the most valuable person we have. And now arguably we're at a spot where knowledge has really been superseded by creativity. And so the evolution of work, if I just drop it into these very coarse buckets, um, has a couple of characteristics to it. The first is they almost always are layers. They're not replacements. So we still have this set of activities going on, the back office part of the firm. We still all do administrative activities as part of our daily life. It's just the value attributed to it and the time spent doing it goes down. We've taught the machines to do more and more. We've spread some of that work around. This idea of creating analytic information is still rock solid in the MBA programs. It's what we are trained to do. It's how you get to business, is you go through this sort of intellectual rigor of learning how to do analysis thoroughly. What's interesting now is the genesis of design thinking. Anybody familiar with that term, the phrase design thinking? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's probably the next big thing. And what's interesting about it to me is that two of the, the two people who are most clearly identified with it, one is Roger Martin, who's the dean of the uh, Rotman School, which is one of the best global business schools at the University of Toronto. He's a finance professor, you know, a senior guy, 60 years old. He's been at finance for a long time. He came to the exact same point as Tim Brown, who's the, the leader, a designer, an industrial designer, the leader of IDEO, which is probably one of the best global consulting firms in the world of design. Not a space design firm so much, mostly objects and systems. But these two guys coming from the left brain and the right brain collided in the middle the same year and both published a book about this same principle that to me is one of the most powerful ideas that design has yet given to uh, the business world and will continue to flow. Essentially what it says is that the methods and techniques of design are ideal for solving complex business problems and we just have never given them the right shrift. We've never given them the right engagement. We haven't opened up the left brain of business to the right brain of design to create this more integrative approach. In fact, interestingly, uh, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who many of you I'm sure have read her books, was emeritus at Harvard, retired, oh, I don't know, two years ago, something like this, and her first blog post on leaving Harvard was essentially mea culpa. We screwed up. We have an entire generation of MBAs who have never learned that there are two sides to their brain. And we've taught them all the analysis and none of the synthesis. They've got all of the drive and not enough of the values and where the hell are we? And this was in the era, you know, post-reflective on some of the great corporate collapses of the last decade. So let's try it through this. We talked too much about this as far as I'm concerned. Generations, there always are a couple of three generations in the workforce, usually four, sometimes three. We think it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. What's important about it is what makes them different. So what makes them different is this. These guys created and perpetuated this structure. This generation with its heroicness, in essence, created the business models and organizations, generally speaking, that we know today. These guys were the big 
pig in the python, post-World War II, gigantically well-educated, historically so, and huge, not just because birth rates were up, but because the externalities, the social conditions that drive how you define a generation endured for quite a long time. And this was things like the racial desegregation movement and the early phases of the women's movement. So this is a very interesting group. Relatively small group as we know, but these are the people, many of whom, many of the people in the room are generation Xers I would guess, um, who grew up for the first time using computers as an assumption. The millennials we know are the network generation, again about as large as this and more well educated. So a very powerful group. This group is also proportionately more well educated, but these guys were the start of that. And then we have this next group that's coming that we're studying now in elementary schools and junior highs. It's really important. How you learn to learn is how you will work. So our, from a research point of view, we study these guys a lot. So we don't know exactly what the character is of that yet, but it's starting to unfold. And we also know that there were a couple of other big technologic things. It's, it's instructive sometimes to remember that the World Wide Web didn't even exist until 1989. And we forget how much change we've inflicted on ourselves in such a short period of time. We forget how slowly humans actually change. And we can adapt, and we can cope, and we can embrace, and we can become excited by, but there is at the lurking back of us, there's this old brain the old part of our brain that's still largely reptilian and still working in old ways about survival and fight and flight. So my point is simply that the stuff that we establish over here is still there. We still struggle for identity. We still make symbols, politics and turf. All of these things still exist and we're walking into this next era now where the information load is driving complexity at unprecedented scales. So what's the net net of this is the current doubling time for the information load that our species holds is a little less than two years, as best people can estimate it. I don't have a dog in the fight, but that's what you hear from MIT if you go talk to them. Which means simply this, that if we took everything we know as a species and put it in a big pile out in front of, what's the address, 30 Monroe? Is that where we are? Put it right there in the plaza, the pile of everything we know about metallurgy, about sex, about art, about physics, about everything. Put it out there in the parking lot. The size of the pile doubles in about two years. That's why we're running like chickens with our heads cut off, is trying to keep up with that, find the opportunity in it, get the meaning out of it, find the value, build the right set of relationships, because you can't possibly understand all that stuff. This is also why collaboration continues to be so important, and why we've just seen the beginning of that. We'll see more and more and more as we attempt to cope with that complexity. So this is, in essence, the landscape of the thing. As a company, we've been through a couple of interesting pieces on this, and the only reason I mention this is to say that, um, like many firms, we've concluded that what motivates people to connect with the value proposition of the firm is not making money, it's the firm having some sort of a purpose. What is it actually doing? And so the purpose statement for our company, which is sort of a combination of mission and vision, that was not something we talk about in public all the time. It's not like an advertising slogan, but I'll say it here because I think it's really important in the context of how this work and attachment question is evolving. So our purpose statement is helping create great experiences wherever work happens. Helping create great experiences wherever work happens. So what do you notice that's missing in there? Hear anything, hear, hear anything in there about furniture, right? What do you hear in there about office or office I mean, it's, it's totally a different thing. So we, we passed 100 last year. That was our 100th birthday. Gives you time to reflect and to pause, to ask about future and to think backwards. And I would say that um, for us as a firm, looking into the future, thinking about the mysteries that all of this suggests and thinking about the strategic choices and the partners and the value proposition and the why of buildings, it drives us down a very different path that's really quite different from the one we've been on in the past. I want to say this simply and quickly. Um, this driving change in building things has got two fundamental roots. The first is this viral evolution of the change in work. And the second is the set of things that happened beginning in the mid-90s that went through 9-11 and now have extended out in this last 20 years. So if we took a snapshot of the last 20 years, I would call this an explosive period of experimentation and change. It's, it's a slow fuse because humans change slowly in this stuff. We can change our laptops much more easily than we can change our personalities and our cultures and our organizations. But this explosion is ultimately about this technologic interconnectedness, the social needs that go along with complex work and the kinds of relationships that live inside of all of that. That explosion is something we're still feeling. Oops. 
<laughs> okay. So, where does it leave us? So that was kind of a look backwards. Um, where does this leave us? What do we actually think is important as companies think forward? There are several things. We see these three things happening gigantically across the business world. The first is being centered on humans is the most important next game. It's not being centered on the purchaser of things or the manager of things. It's being centered on the person doing the things. That's different. This is not out of some great democratization impulse. This is not a social movement. This is a practical issue. This is a practical issue that getting and developing people involves being user-centered. And I don't mean about spaces, although it does include that. It means being simply centered on people. The second is that people are attached to something bigger called purpose. If you want to see a fantastic, if you haven't read the book Drive by Dan Pink, I would recommend it. If you want to see the shortcut to the book, go on YouTube tonight and search out Drive, um, Drive, Motivation is what he's talking about, and RSA. So RSA plus Drive. Do the Boolean thing, you'll find it. It's a little 10 minute video on this book that's based on a whole lot of very contemporary research that came out of the Fed and Carnegie Mellon that looked at the health of organizations in the context of connection of people to the venture. I won't go into all of the research, but the net net of it is, this is what motivates people. Um, as we know from Maslow, right, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you learned about it in Psych 101 in college someplace, once you get beyond survival, once you get beyond the basics, you start to be motivated by other things. And while everybody is always $10,000 short in their paycheck, this is a universal human truism, if we just had 10,000 bucks more, we'd be okay. Um, there's always that bit, because we live in a commercial society. On the other hand, what motivates people is not that. And we can talk more about that if you wish. I'm an old HR guy, I'll just throw you one quick one on this. That, um, what's the, what would you guess the salary load is, the white collar salary load in the city of Chicago is today? I mean, nobody knows, right? It's a big number. We spent a lot of money to have all of us here. And what was the average raise across corporate America this year for white collar workers? What percent? Three. Two to three percent. Yep, that's exactly right. And what's the proof that that two to three percent against this very big number of the value of these people as measured by salary, what's the proof that that two to three percent is going to gain you anything as a company? No, in fact, I see people shaking their heads. We all know it. There is no proof. Trust me on this. I'm a research guy and this is my world. I'm an organizational development person. There's no proof. Raises do not increase performance. What do raises do? Well, they do that and they do serve as a reward and the reward serves to keep you, right? Because if you don't get a raise for a couple of years, what happens? You get dissatisfied and oftentimes you'll leave. A lot of people don't leave though. What happens is a great study on this. Uh, Dan Yankelovich, a sociologist, talks about this. Discretionary effort. I talked about this earlier today. It's a great, it's a great thing. So discretionary effort. What's the, the deal with this is this. That you've got to perform at some minimal level necessary to avoid being fired. Okay? Whatever that is. Not that any of us would do that, of course. None of us. But there's some level that you have to perform at to avoid being fired. By definition, you're not going to get fired if you do at least that. So cross-sectionally, 49% of the business population from CEO to first year person in the mailroom is performing 49% at the minimum level necessary to avoid being fired by their own assessment. Wow. Now, how much more can you contribute if you start to give more than that? And what motivates people to give more? Does more mean more hours? Does more mean, what does more mean? Stock options sometimes, is it money? Sometimes, Pink's research would say it's not that much so much, although we are motivated by that. We're very transparent, we're very simplistic, right? We eat too many calories, we need too much money, we have all these things going on, but when you get underneath the superficial, what motivates people is connection, a sense of participation in something, where we're together in something. That's what the motivational research suggests anyway. So, a couple of quick thoughts on this, and then we'll get to the close. We believe that studying this is easy because it's already here. So Gibson, one of the great sci-fi writers, talked about this in a book. If you haven't ever read this, by the way, it's worth the read. I'm not a big science fiction re reader, but The Neuromancer is one of the all-time classics. It, in fact, is what Bill Gates was reading when he founded Microsoft, and Microsoft was a phrase coined by Gibson in this book. Bill was living under his desk in Texas building this firm, and he took the name of the company out of Gibson's book, a Microsoft. 
We believe you can see the future. We believe that the future occurs at the intersection between the human-centered work experience, which is what we study, and these dimensions of humanness, and that understanding that is ultimately where we uncork the value. That's the way we understand the value of work. Our own work agenda, I just thought I'd throw, or research agenda, I just thought I'd throw this out, has these three things. All of the work, there's only 24 of us in our group, but we're mostly people like, well, they're not like me, fortunately, but they're people in the social science disciplines, largely. And we're looking at these three domains to try and understand. There are 14 projects that scatter around this. This is an ongoing sort of an effort. So the distributed landscapes means, in essence, how work happens in a planetary level. This notion of sustainable enterprise is people, planet, profit, plus brand and well-being. So personal well-being, health of brands, and then people, planet, profit. And then emergent work practices, this whole genesis of creative work and what that means. That's what we think is going to matter. Now, how do you learn all this stuff? I've, a lot of you haven't done field work, so I thought I would just share this quick video of what doing research in the field actually looks like. Oops. Oh. The boy's a wizard, a true star. <laughs> Field work is tough. Collaboration is really important. <laughs> what? I. Wait a minute. Hmm, what? I. Uh, I. Oh boy. Sorry, I'll just go out the other door. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Oh, excuse me, I had to do that. I just love that clip. It is. It's kind of funny. Oops, excuse me. I'll kill myself here. It is kind of fun. Doing field work is the best thing in the world. Um, people will show you things that they will never tell you. When we send out surveys, um, I could go into a long treatise about this. Good surveys are a very powerful tool in social science. It's a really important idea. Um, we're a boots on the ground research group. Oh, I'm whacking my mic, aren't I? Sorry about that. So what's different about that is rather than send out a survey to 500 millennials in China, we go put four people in Chinese companies for a year and watch them work and learn from that. It's a very different approach to, um, to the field of understanding human behavior. So what do we see happening when we do all this stuff? So we're almost at the end here. We see five basic patterns emerging. I'll just highlight these very quickly. The ongoing re-questioning of real estate and why we have it, how much of it we need, and how, where it should be located, and how all this fits together is obvious. It's going to continue to happen. Um, it is the root thing that's going on up here, as you correctly said. It is what's driving this net utilization per person. I think this is actually the best thing that's ever happened to the collective industries of spaces, by the way. Because what this means, if we see this falling at 40, 50 percent, which is what it's already fallen, right? Core net numbers would tell you, roughly speaking, 40 percent of most spaces are unoccupied at a given time. It doesn't mean they should be, all be occupied. But we have a great degree of space that's been provided by people like us and the designers and the real estate people in the room that's been provided for people that they're not using. Now, are they not using it because they're lazy slobs and they're not working? Probably not. They're actually probably working harder than they've ever worked. They're just not using the tools we've provided. And so what this does, in my view, is it gives us a license to go recreate this. Because what's happening is the I orientation of this and the we orientation of this and this suggests a new mix. I think there's actually an amazing opportunity in this real estate utilization discussion to do some powerful things. Attraction and retention is a bad idea unless it results in engagement and development. The problem with attraction and retention is if you get the right people and you keep them forever and you don't engage them and develop them, what you end up with is expensive old people. And that's not helpful. What you want is people who are engaged and well-developed and sharing. As the boom retires, first boomer hit the skids last year on their way off to the happy hunting ground. And uh, 
it's a powerful idea to ask, how's the knowledge transfer going to happen? An awful lot of the knowledge from that generation is held tacitly, not explicitly. The transference of that is based on trust. Trust tends to come from getting to know people. If I see you, I'll get to know you. If I get to know you, I may trust you. If I trust you, I may share. That series of events bodes very well for the value of space as an organizational tool to generational transitioning. Collaboration we already talked about. Brand I'm not going to talk about now, I'll get to in a second. And this notion of well-being we think is the next big one. Well-being net-net um, is an emotional thing much more than it's a physical thing. Wellness is a physical thing. We understand the, the science of wellness much better than we understand the science of well-being. Getting people to give of their discretionary effort is an emotional condition, not a physical condition. If we think the work is going creative and knowledge, then we get people engaged better by engaging them completely, which means emotionally. So in close, what have we learned so far out of all this in terms of doing this work, in terms of the future of buildings? The built environment is where culture breathes. There's nothing wrong with cubes. Cubes were a great idea. They've outlived their usefulness. It's time to move on, and we are moving on as a species. The evidence is obvious. Walk through a building. Where are the people? Well, they're not in their cubes at the level that they would have been in the past. That's not a reflection necessarily on cubes. Cubes were fine for then. They're not so fine for now. What's really happening is this. Routine process is given away to cognitive and social. You don't need a cube for that. You need to be with other people for that. Or you need to be concentrating someplace. And cubes are a bad compromise for both. Again, made sense then, not so much now. Culture is all about the evolution of this notion of knowledge. And living together is where that comes from. So we see the end of the Dilbert era. This is the one I said a second ago I was going to talk about with relation to brand. We tend to think brand, when we say brand in space, what, what conjures up in your mind? Ah, we ought to have our spaces reflect our brand, says the CEO. What does that mean? The wall, the color of the logo. Yeah, yeah, a little art, a little color. What else does it mean? Because that's not what it's for, right? That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that at all. So how do you get brand? What does brand look like? What does it mean? Big, big topic. I'm not going to try and lecture you. I'm sure most of you are more expert on this than I am by an order of magnitude. I'll simply say that when we think about brand as an external thing or as a communications thing, we're missing the central point, which is ultimately the brand is about behavior. So if we want to teach people to kiss the frog, which is a different, a risky thing, we're teaching them new things. We've taught them already the things that they think mean being part of organization. We've taught them all this stuff. We're trying to teach them something new. We're saying to them, whether they've been in the workforce one year, five years, or 50 years, we're saying that yes, all that stuff still matters, but now we need you to do something different. Change is very difficult for people. No one wants it except a wet baby. How we move through this process of getting people to engage differently in the workforce is a behavioral question. Now, it turns out that brand is ultimately behavioral. When you come here today and you touch a person from WorkSpring, they are the brand. They're the brand in the midst of the physical brand. But you get a new laptop from Dell tonight. You get home, hey, the new laptop came, honey. Great. Let me boot her up. Well, it doesn't boot up too well for some reason. So you pick up the phone and you call the help desk. And that person on the other end is the brand, right? The brand experience in the knowledge and creative industries is exclusively human. Nothing matters except the human touch points in the knowledge and creative industries, in the sort of um, service-based world. And so brand is ultimately behavioral. Brand is ultimately behavioral. Internal relationships and relationships internally to clients. Behavior over time is culture. The way we get culture is through behavior over time. That's where it comes from. We reproduce behaviors that we either receive a sanction or a reward for doing, and those things become the nature of the culture. And so this is how cities evolve, right? This is how the city, so let's just think about it for a second. What's, what's uh, the similarity and difference between Chicago and Detroit? No automobiles here. Chicago made a different choice through a set of activities over a long period of time. Through a set of activities over a long period of time, it became a different kind of a city, right? Well, was it about the climate too? No, the climate's exactly the same. Was it about the access to transportation arteries and water? No, that's exactly the same. Chicago and Detroit are both on the Great Lakes. Climate's got the same climate. Immigrant population genetic base? No, they were settled by the exact same subsets of people at the exact same time. Military history? No, they both started out as forts. 
Why did they turn out so differently? Why is one an amazing, vibrant place that everybody wants to be, where real estate's off the charts and you're building buildings like crazy, and the other is the left armpit of the world that they're going to turn back into farms? Why? Well, the answer to that is in the nature of what those activities were that people began to perform and how they got trapped in their own assumptions. That's where cities come from. That's where this idea of culture comes from these behaviors, and cultures always create places. And this is where I want to make a, a, a point out of this. The learning in here is that the value in place making is bigger than the value of place. The building you get is a tool at the end. Let's be, let's be a family for a minute. You and your spouse are going to rebuild uh, a new house, or you're going to move. And so you go out and start looking, or you go out and hire an architect, and you're going to build a new space. So this place-making process is where all the discovery happens, right? It's where you have those debates about, do you really want a horse, or do you want to walk to the opera? Which do you want? Because you can't do them both. What are we going to do? What's the next phase going to be like? So the place-making process in buildings forces people to think forward to the next set of behaviors which become what the family is. The dynamic of this is what's so powerful and why the real estate and design communities have such an amazing amount of influence in the way organizations behave. Because they're sitting there at the table when the discussion about what the next house for the family is. I think, I would argue, we're not doing a good job for our clients, however. We're letting them tell us what we think the next thing should be. And that is fundamentally that space is basically bad. Make it cost less. By the way, we don't have any time for this programming stuff you guys want to talk about. That's sweet, but we're not going to do it. We're behind schedule. We're over budget. We really just don't have time. So why don't you do what you did for them before and lower the panels four inches because we're really thinking about collaboration. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, give me a break. OK. Creating and delivering experiences, big deal. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this except this. This is really, this is the uh, whole talk in and of itself. This basically says that when you're going to try and figure out where your opportunity lies, that's what this is, opportunity themes, themes of opportunity, don't look at trends. At least don't look exclusively at trends. It's way too easy to get sucked up into the little stuff that's constantly oscillating and changing. You know, what's the latest this? What's the latest that? What happened at Best Buy or Google last or Yahoo last week? These are little things. Stand back, see these in context, but understand them in terms of human time. Values, trends plus values equals opportunity themes is the mantra here. These values are things like simplicity and plurality and pleasure. These are things that endure across cultures and across time that slow down the fast-paced oscillations of all this stuff. Humans move at this pace. Technology tends to move at this pace. And it's in that tension that ultimately we have this big opportunity. Uh, technology and space are becoming one system. It's a system tool question. They're becoming one tool. One tool in favor of a social system at work. The value in an organization gets created here as you go up. It spends money down here. We need to enter the discussion here, not here. The purpose of buildings is ultimately people, starting with shelter and moving up from there. We need to think about the social health of systems. We need to think about the hard stuff that we don't know how to measure today. <clears throat> there are all sorts of claims out there about what's true. There are all sorts of people claiming to be able to measure things that actually are hard to measure. I would say this, that as we look at this next era, and I'll just show you an example of it here. Getting to the root of measurement of human behavior is a big deal. So this is a badge. This came out of a group called Sociometric Solutions at MIT. You can pass that around. It's a very interesting badge. We just finished a phase two test on this. Um, what this badge does is it listens to you, and everybody wears one. So we just finished a test with 70 people wearing them, and 50 badges spread out into our building where people live. So the spaces are instrumented, the people are instrumented. The badge listens. What's it listening for? Content? Not at all. Could care less. Doesn't know about content. What it listens for is voice. Voice tone, volume, frequency variance, and when there's over-talking between two people. So if Laurie and I are in this interesting meeting, and we start to talk over the top of each other, and then one of us pops up and runs over to the marker board, because it's also got a potentiometer in it that knows when movement's happening. And by the way, the board knows that I just came because it's instrumented as well. And then she comes over, and the voice tone varies even more. And the eye-to-eye -eye contact that this is seeing with the infrared camera and digitizing all this information across 70 people for a month, my god, 
This is the ultimate way to decipher human behavior. Right? Unbelievable, if you can understand it. So where are we in this? We're just learning. Is it possible? There's a fantastic article on this in last April's Harvard Business Review, if you're interested. I'll be happy to send you a copy. The new science of great teams. The net net of this is, we believe it is the case that we'll be able to use big data from these kinds of technologies to actually evaluate what's a good place for collaboration or not a good place. When is quality collaboration happening? When is productivity happening? These are questions that we don't have good answers for today. And today, the question about what space is for, we tend to go to the airy fairy. Oh, it's all about daylight. It's all about collaboration. Well, yeah, it is about those things, but prove it. We can't prove it. This is proof. This could be very interesting. This could change the game in many ways. Last couple of points. We leave our people at the kids' table uh, in the discussions about buildings too much. They manage these discussions all the time in their personal lives. We leave them at the kids' table like at Thanksgiving when there's overflow. And they can't sit up with the grown-ups and be part of the discussion. And it's silly. In fact, we have the buildings because we have people. We don't have buildings to support real estate companies, design companies, furniture companies, furniture dealers. We don't have them for those reasons. We have them because we have humans who have to work someplace. They can work at Starbucks. They can work at home. They can work at the office. Where are they going to choose to work? That's the model that's unfolding in front of us. How are they going to connect globally? That's the model that's unfolding. Engaging them in that process of discovery is a big deal. And that means we're going to have to irritate some of the systems. Never an oyster made a pearl that was happy. Pearls are made because oysters are irritated. The grain of sand gets in there and they start and they wrap it up in something and they keep wrapping it up until you get a pearl, right? That's where pearls come from. So something of great beauty comes from a source of irritation. I would argue that if we're not irritating our systems enough to create something new, we're missing the point. The vacancy rates are high today. In some cities, it's not an issue. In some cities, it's a cataclysmic issue. In some cultures, it plays totally differently than it plays here. Therein lay the opportunity. That's the dynamic of the situation. So my point on this one is simply that if we ask people what they need, if we do a survey, say, what do you need? They're going to tell us everything about what they used to do and what they fear we're going to take if they're not really protective. And so asking is a lousy way to understand. And if we're not getting a certain amount of irritation out of our system, we probably aren't pushing the thing hard enough. That's the general point of this one. Thanks. I appreciate your time letting me yell at you. I didn't mean to yell at you. <laughs> but I thank you for being interested enough to at least come.